Good morning, everyone. Well, it is a joy to be with you. This is my fifth visit to the Philippines, but only my first visit to your church. Uh, I have known your pastor, as he said, for some time, and I have been aware of your church uh, through uh, visits that he has made to the church that I serve in the United Kingdom and also through regular emails that I receive from him. So it is a privilege to be with you now, to see you uh, in the flesh and to be able to identify with you in this way as brothers and sisters in Christ and to bring you the Word of God this morning, uh, that uh, is indeed a, a high privilege on my part, and I'm very glad to be here. Um, I bring greetings to you from my own church. Uh, Lancaster is a small city of about 80,000 people. If you can imagine that, those of you who live in Metro Manila and the uh, surrounding greater Manila with all these many millions of people. Imagine what it's like to live in just a small town of 80,000 people. It's a historic city. It has a medieval castle that dominates it. Uh, so uh, I'm in a very different setting uh, this morning from the one that I normally know. But it is a joy to be here. Would you turn with me please to Mark chapter 8. And I want to home in on just two verses, verse 36 and verse 37. I normally like to give headings for my messages from the Word of God, uh, subheadings, subtitles, if you will. Uh, I hope you find that helpful just to aid your own memory. And uh, I have two this morning, something you can't gain and something you could possibly lose. So we'll begin with something that you can't gain. Now we have before us in these two verses two questions from the Lord Jesus Christ two very probing questions. The Lord Jesus of Christ is, of course, the most compelling figure known to history, and he is the founder of the Christian church. And these questions occur in the middle of a series of statements that he made about the nature of true discipleship statements that are very uh, short, very terse, and they leave us in no doubt that if we are to follow Jesus in this world, that will be a stiff challenge. It will not be easy. And at the very heart of it, verse 34, it will be a matter of self-denial, it will be a matter of bearing the cross. Now, what did the Lord Jesus Christ mean when he said that every single follower of his, whatever age a person might be, whatever background a person might come from, male or female, every follower of his would have to take up the cross. Well, those words take us right back to the first century. When the Romans wanted to crucify a convicted criminal, part of the ceremony, the ritual of crucifixion, involved humiliating the victim. You did not simply take away a person's life, you took his good name as well. 
you took that person's dignity from him and you required the person to carry the cross beam of the cross not the whole thing it would be much too heavy for an individual human being to carry but the cross beam was taken through the streets of the city to the place of execution and all the crowds would hurl abuse at the person they had the opportunity to cry out uh, at the person to ridicule the person and Jesus meant you see that if we are to be his followers we must consider ourselves in the same light as convicted criminals on death row we must hold our lives cheap how much do we value the Lord Jesus Christ do we value him enough to give up our good name for his sake and if it came to it it may never come to it but it just might sometimes in some situations for some of the Lord's people and if it did come to it would be willing would we be willing to give up life itself we have learned this very morning that in Egypt some of our brothers and sisters have been called upon to make that sacrifice now it's at this stage that we meet these two disturbing questions what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul and then or what will a man give in exchange for his soul now like many of the things that Jesus said they are the kind of statements that startle us they bring us up short to begin with the Son of God is telling us something about human nature here and it's this here in verse 36 we're being told that mankind in general is preoccupied with gain and that is a universal wherever you find human beings whatever culture people come from whatever race people come from whatever background people come from human beings are preoccupied with gain you and I we belong to an acquisitive species people of whatever kind wherever you find them on the surface of this planet are always trying to accumulate money and things have you observed this as you look around do you find that the people you know are trying to add to their stock of money and things now at one level at one level this is not necessarily sinful it's right that we should provide for our families but nevertheless the Lord Jesus Christ was hinting here at something he was hinting that people have an appetite for these things that goes well beyond simply providing for their needs and the needs of their loved ones I once spent two years of my life studying a subject called economics it was in my final two years at high school just before I graduated from high school and before I went to university uh, do people study economics also in the Philippines it's an interesting subject uh, almost the first lesson that you learn in economics uh, when you're being introduced to that subject is something that is called the economic problem and this is what it is 
It's the idea that individual people have what are called infinite wants. But nevertheless, the world, the world at large, has finite resources. So individuals have infinite wants. There's no end to the things that people want, but the world contains finite resources. Now let's put that very simply. You can't have it all because there's not enough to go around. In the 19th century, there was a theorist called Thomas Malthus who pushed this to its very conclusion and he argued that the real problem with our world is that it contains too many people. And what he then said, you see, is that the answer to it is extreme birth control measures. Now, as some of you probably know, they have tried to uh, develop a solution to this in the People's Republic of China by limiting families to only one child per family. Uh, but the way that it's worked out in practice is that everybody wants to have a, a son and not necessarily a daughter. So there has developed over the last few decades an imbalance in the population between males and females. Uh, because if uh, people know that their, uh, their, you know, ladies know that they're carrying a daughter, they'll take steps to procure an abortion. So it's already having the result of creating an imbalance in the population. Now the Son of God here in this passage was not simply pointing out this sort of thing, that we live on a small planet and that there's a lot of us and we need to learn how to share and share alike. That's not what he was saying. He put his finger on what it is that makes human beings tick. He had identified something that is part of our nature as a fallen species. The Lord Jesus had shrewdly noted what you might call the normal human view of success. Now, when you hear one person say about another person, oh, he's done well for himself. He's done well in life. Now, what you mean is that he's earned enough money to buy himself a dream home and that he's got a really nice car. In fact, maybe they've got two nice cars, one for himself, one for his wife. And not only that, uh, you know, he can afford a couple of vacations a year. Maybe they go abroad somewhere really nice, take a cruise on one of those big cruise liners. <coughs> He's got a pension plan so that he can retire early and in comfort. You know the sort of thing? One thing that has amazed me since my last visit to the Philippines in 2005, I don't think Filipino people are any different, is the number of shopping malls that has expanded in this country since I last came. A new SM in Marikina. The Mall of Asia, that wasn't here when I came before. Do, do you, you know, is there a shortage of shopping malls in this country? <laughs> that you need to build another one every six months? And there is a, a kind of industry that has grown up around pandering to the fascination that we have with rich people and the opulence of their lifestyles. In the United Kingdom, there is a newspaper called the Sunday Times. And once a year, it publishes what it calls the Rich List. And that is a list of the 1,000 richest people in the UK. And it lists them in order so that you can find out who is the very richest. The Queen is on there near the top. 
but uh, all the other two, and it shows you where they were last year. So you can see who is up and who is down. Uh, it, uh, it's interesting to find out where a certain author named J.K. Rowling is. Uh, she's a lady who lives in Scotland and uh, she's worth more than 500 million pounds because of the Harry Potter books. Now, there's a magazine that circulates in the UK called Hello Magazine. And it pays a fortune every time it learns that certain celebrities are going to get married so that it can take photographs of the wedding and publish it in the pages of the magazine so that you can uh, get a picture of uh, the, the wedding breakfast and you can see what the hotel was like and how it was furnished so that even ordinary people can get a glimpse of the way these people live. Now so often you see we find that what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying is on a collision course with the way that most people think. Now just think of these words that were once spoken by the Son of God. Take heed, beware of covetousness, for a person's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. That's Luke chapter 12 verse 15. But when you pause and think that through, wouldn't you agree that a lot of people do think that life consists in the abundance of the things that they possess? You see, wealth provides what you might call insulation against the shocks of life. Wealth provides choices. If you have it, you can afford better schools for the kids. If you have it, well, you don't have to worry when you fall sick. You can afford the hospital bills. You can take vacations when you want to. No wonder the prophet Jeremiah counseled the rich man not to glory in his riches. Jeremiah 9.23 It's so easy for wealthy people to fool themselves that they have covered all their options. To say to their hearts, everything is okay. I've got enough in the bank. I've got enough put by. If anything should happen, if any emergency should occur, I'll be okay. My family will be okay. But even in the short saying we have before us in this passage, it's clear that our Savior wanted his hearers to understand that wealth creation has its limits. Can anyone gain the whole world? I ask you, can anyone gain the whole world? Verse 30, is that a realistic ambition? Now, of course, there are some people who are wealthy to an eye-popping degree. There are soccer players now in England who earn £200,000 in one week. Now, just to give you an idea, the, the English pound is worth 65 pesos. You'll have to do the math very quickly in your heads, but 200,000 pounds in one week. I would not expect to see 200,000 pounds in a lifetime of, of working hard, and they get it in a week.
some of the richest people at the moment are Russian billionaires and just because they've got so much money they don't know what to do with it they're building super yachts motorized pleasure yachts you know each one with its own helicopter pad and and its own swimming pool sometimes two swimming pools and, uh, and uh, they can't bear to be have a smaller yacht than their rivals so uh, each one will make sure that his yacht is two meters longer than the other guy's yacht and when they hear that another one has got a, a new model this year they sell off the old one and commission a brand new one and so it goes on now of course at that level it becomes just a matter of status and boosting the ego I heard once about a Hollywood movie mogul one of those Americans who owned the movie studios and he said that he spent years climbing to the top of the tree only to find that when he got there he discovered there was nothing there you see the real problem is that greed is never satisfied there's an interesting statement from the Old Testament in the prophecy of Haggai chapter 1 and verse 6 the prophet spoke about those in ancient Israel who were earning wages as though to put it into a bag full of holes you imagine you know putting money into a money bag but the money bag had a hole in the bottom so they kept on putting money in but it never got full and as the Apostle Paul said to Timothy even in this life riches are uncertain Paul said to Timothy to warn his people that riches are uncertain riches are precarious they can drain away those who accumulate riches become anxious and nervous because they've no guarantee that they'll be able to keep them brothers and sisters we have this one life this one and only life and if we look at this life from the perspective of eternity wealth creation was never meant to be our chief goal what do you think the Lord Jesus Christ meant by these words man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God now meeting the needs of the body is all very well and good but a receptive heart a receptive mind to everything that God reveals in his word that is of the first importance and I would plead with you to consider this the passage before us is inviting a question it's this what do we live for what do we live for and look at much of the TV output that is current and you'll find that our contemporaries are living for things like a home upgrade I was going through one of the malls only the other day and uh, smartly dressed young ladies kept giving me flyers uh, offering me the opportunity to uh, uh, buy a flat in a new uh, an apartment and a new condo uh, so many people you know the want the dream home don't they now in posing the two questions before us the Lord Jesus Christ is showing up an ugly reality uh, people who are content with their possessions people who are happy with what they've got well we have a, a phrase in England 
People like that are as rare as hen's teeth. Did you get that? As rare as hen's teeth. Hens don't have any teeth. <laughs> All over the world, people are obsessed with the thought of gain. But while none of us can hope to gain the whole world, each of us will certainly lose everything that we worked so hard to accumulate down here. There's a homely phrase that we often hear. You can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. Now, it's based on a statement that we find in the Word of God. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 7. We brought nothing into this world, and it's certain that we can carry nothing out. Now, brothers and sisters, I, d I don't mean to say this to scare anybody. And I don't mean to be insensitive, but, you know, shrouds don't have pockets. When you wrap up a corpse in a shroud, there's no pocket, no place for a billfold. Think of those ancient kings from centuries long ago who were buried with what are called grave goods. The pagans believed that they would need these things in the next world. There was one Chinese king who even had a bodyguard of 10,000 soldiers made of pottery, the famous Terracotta Army. Well, I wonder whether they were much help to him. They're a wonderful thing to see if you've ever seen any of them. The Chinese government loaned a number of them to the British Museum not long ago and uh, the craftsmanship of the ancient uh, uh, Chinese craftsmen who made them, you have to admire it, but I don't suppose that he got any help from them when he went into the next world. And if you were to take your plastic cards into your coffin, Will you have access to an ATM in the next world to ensure plenty of ready cash drawn from the bank account that you used in this world? One of the most probing, challenging parables that the Lord Jesus told concerns a character who is actually called the rich fool. But here is the thing that we should draw from it. As far as most people are concerned, in the world that you and I know, the rich fool would be reckoned a success. He's the sort of person that many people would regard as a role model. They would want to be just like him. He had done well in life. He was ready to retire. He had built up his farm. His barns were full. He decided to expand the business. He had a bumper crop. He was aglow with satisfaction at his achievements. It was only then that God said to him, You fool! This night your soul will be required. And then, who will have those things that you have provided? There's something that you can't gain. You can't gain everything that you want down here. You certainly can't gain the world. But in addition to all that, there's something that you might lose. That's our second heading, our second subtitle. As we've seen, you can't gain the world. You were actually made for better things than that. 
you have only one life. And it's at this point that the real weight of Jesus' challenge sinks in. You see, even if you were to gain a very great deal, if you were to be a success in the way that many people understand success, you might make a very bad bargain indeed because you could lose something much more precious than money and things. No less an authority than the Son of God, the very person that Almighty God has appointed to be the judge of the whole world, Acts chapter 17 verse 31, he has declared that there are some people who actually lose their souls. Think of that. Some people lose their souls. Just allow the awfulness of that to sink in for a moment. From the moment that you and I first drew breath, you have been in possession of a treasure that is far more valuable than the riches of the pharaohs of Egypt. than the crown jewels of England. All of the things that Queen Elizabeth has. There's a place called the Tower of London. And you wouldn't believe the security you have to get past these days to be allowed as a member of the public to look uh, through several layers of plate glass to look at the ancient jewelry that is kept there. Now even so, this wonderful treasure that you have, that's your very own, you can be parted from it. And all it takes to lose it, all it takes is neglect on your part, negligence and folly. In fact, if you were to ask me what does it take, what do you have to do to lose your soul, I would say to you, all you have to do is nothing at all. You just have to continue with the same mindset, the same outlook, the same attitude towards Almighty God that you had from the cradle onwards. And if you go on in life with the same attitude that you had when you were a baby, it will happen anyway. The human soul is immortal. That means that it will outlast the rise and fall of mighty empires. Think of that. The human soul will even outlast this wicked world itself. Now, let me try to make this as clear as I can. It means that the soul of Pontius Pilate is still around to regret washing his hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. It means that the soul of Judas is still around to reproach himself many times a day for the terrible evil of the traitor's kiss. It also means, on the other hand, that the soul of John, the beloved disciple, and those of his friends are still entranced and overjoyed. They've enjoyed the love of Christ for 2,000 years or so now and will go on to do so 
for the whole of eternity. Souls can be lost. Now, what did the Lord Jesus Christ mean by this terrifying expression? I wouldn't want anyone here to lose theirs. I, now, the Lord Jesus did not mean by this that you and your soul might part company in some way. After all, the soul is that part of our nature which can never die. When this mortal life comes to its close, the soul continues to await the resurrection of the body. The Lord Jesus' striking language here about some people losing their soul is actually a very pointed way of saying that we lose ourselves. All that we are can be lost for eternity. Now what does that mean? It means in practice that we will be banished from the presence of God. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, I've often been struck by the way that Jesus referred on several occasions to some who will leave this world behind and be sent away into what he called outer darkness. Matthew 25 verse 30 for example. Imagine it. The darkness outside. The darkness outside. It's as though heaven is a world of light and celebration and feasting and laughter and joy. But there on the outside, there are others who can't get in. And all they can do is look on in misery and regret the willfulness and the folly of knowing that they had the opportunity to enter while there was still room. But they did not take that opportunity and now they will always be on the outside and never get in. And what is the crucial factor? What is it that will settle a person's destiny for all eternity? Now according to verse 36, one thing is decisive. It's our attitude to the Lord Jesus Christ and his words. It's what we make of Jesus himself and the things that he says. Now, what do you think of Jesus? Please understand that God the Father thinks everything of him. On two occasions, he spoke to that effect in an audible voice from heaven that could be heard by people on this earth. So what in that case is your verdict on Jesus? He is a man who made remarkable claims for himself. I am the bread of life. John 6 verse 48. Now what else could Jesus mean in saying that other than that there is a hunger, an ache, a deep longing within the core of every man and woman and young person that goes unsatisfied and only he can meet that hunger. Now you can fill the stomach 
with the finest gourmet meals, but it still won't get near solving that problem because the real emptiness is more to do with a sense of meaning and a sense of significance and a sense of purpose and only the Lord Jesus can provide that. Now in the same way, John 7, 37 and following, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. People long for spiritual vitality, for spiritual life, but they can't produce it themselves. It's not something they can work up inside their own hearts and lives. But Jesus claimed that he could give inexhaustible supplies of that life to anyone who came to him. But what do you make of this? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, what do you make then, not only of the man that Jesus was, but of his words? There's a widespread perception that the Lord Jesus Christ was so benign, that he was so mild, that no one could ever take exception to him. But actually, when you read the Gospels, the things that he said provoked extreme reactions from people. Some were drawn to him. Some loved him. Some felt that sin seemed so ugly, but heaven seemed so close, and they could not help themselves but follow him. But others were more than ready to hate him and denounce him as a blasphemer. Now, Jesus' words still divide people. Some find that their hearts are one. Others find when they listen to the kind of things I've been saying that they just become angry. Now, that's bound to be the case with words like this. And if the Son of God were here today, he would make it plain that putting his words on a level with those of other religious teachers, suggesting as some do that Jesus was just like Buddha, just like Muhammad, that that kind of thing is sheer nonsense. To say that kind of thing is playing for very high stakes indeed. The Lord Jesus did not see himself as one guru among many others. Is the Lord Jesus Christ an embarrassment to you? Do some of the things that he says make you wince? Now if that's the case, you've not yet learned to put a high enough value on your own soul. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world but lose his own soul? Well, brothers and sisters, thank you for a patient hearing. Now let's pray together. Be pleased, most merciful God, to grant that we might learn what it means to feel the weight of sin, to feel the weight of your love for us, to sense something of the vastness of eternity, and to learn what it means to entrust our whole selves to all that the Lord Jesus Christ is. We thank you for the wonder of his love for us, and we marvel at it. O oh, blessed God, teach us more and more to grow in our estimation of him. And all this for Jesus' sake. Amen.